Hello, welcome to the Invest Crop Pollination Model uh, training video. Uh, this will be a training from me, Eric Lonsdorf, and Chris Newtonboom. Uh, I also want to acknowledge some of the original co-authors of the model and the kind of paper that this was based off of, Taylor Ricketts, Neil Williams, Ray Winfrey, and Claire Kremen. All right, uh, and so I'm going to talk really briefly about the importance of pollination, the theory about mapping the service, basically the production function, and how we uh, value the pollinator providing habitats, a little bit how we've used the model, and then Chris will give a brief demo. Okay, so if you're working on this, you probably already know and recognize that pollinators are really important. They provide up to 35% of the global food supply by improving 75% of globally important crops. And then for biodiversity, they're also really important. They obviously support pollinations of many, many plants. 60 to 90% of all angiosperms require some form of external pollination. Most of the time, this is gonna be bees. And it's been shown to be a limiting factor of reproduction for nat many natural plant populations. Okay, and for evaluating the service, um, this is just another example of an ecosystem service or those benefits that uh, nature provides people, nature's contributions to people or NCPs might be another way that you think of them. And there are two key steps to quantifying them that I'm going to go over this ecological production function and then the economic valuation. The production function links the ecology of the, of the system with the particular service. So in this case, it would, if we're thinking about strawberry production, we're going to model just that plant pollinator interaction, the bees landing on the flower, providing pollination that leads to some sort of fruit. That fruit has value to people. So if you go to the market and purchase it, we can kind of then link that value that's going to be provided to society back to the service being um, provided by the bee itself. And we do that for management decisions. We're interested in how changes in the landscape would translate into changes in dollar values, right? Or, or some sort of value. And we can break that down by understanding how the pollinator system changes with changes in the landscape. And if we can understand that, we can connect it then with how changes in yield uh, are affected by pollination and then therefore, and then the, the, obviously the changes in dollar. And by putting that all together, we get, we get the full component of changes in dollars to landscape. So that first part that I'm gonna talk about is this ecological production function. Uh, which here is the, the model, and you can read more about the details of that model uh, in the INVEST guide. But here is uh, just a training session of the bees to make sure they follow along exactly what the model is doing. Um, we want to make sure they're, that their ecology is, um, you know, the bees kind of understand what we're trying to do. I'm kidding, of course, what we're actually doing is trying to represent bee ecology uh, with the model. And so here's how we were thinking about it. Uh, so here is an example landscape. Um, we can imagine bees uh, in a nest right there. And um, this is a representative landscape. Uh, the yellow kind of in the middle might be a crop of some kind that requires bees. And there's wildland uh, in the surroundings. So if we have a nest site where the bee is, uh, we can represent that bees moving around in the landscape. We can assume that forage resources closer by are more important than those farther away. And so we have this distance decay function. So we can assess the quality of that landscape. And we also know that sometimes bees vary, or we know that bees vary. Some go really far, some go much shorter. And so for this one, if it's a bee that doesn't fly very far, it may not be able to get into that wildland, which may provide lots of great resources. And if a bee can go farther, it can, it can access that. And so we can kind of, um, model the fitness of the bees in that nest site by where they are with in relation to those resources. And we've done a lot of tests in agricultural systems. And I just want to talk a little bit briefly about how we've uh, validated the, the, the theory in the model. Uh, this was their, an original study in Yolo County, California in the Central Valley where there's lots of different um, crop types. And here, uh, my colleagues sampled bees in watermelon fields. That's where those black dots are. And the way the model works uh, is first we translate that landscape into different nesting guilds. So we can translate that land cover map into four guilds, stem nesting, cavity nesters, wood, and ground. And then the, here the green represents uh, good quality uh, and the reds are poor quality. 
All right, so these are, and we'll get into sort of the, the tables that are required to translate that. And then we convert that same landscape into floral resources. And the reason it looks a little fuzzy is because we're modeling how bees are moving. All right, and so this is a, a distance weighted convolution, it's called, that weights floral resources in different seasons. So here you can have spring, summer, and fall. Um, you could just have one season if that's all you know about. And this model then basically adds up the, the quality of those floral resources uh, in the landscape. All right, and then we put the, those two layers together to create this integrated assessment of the overall quality of the abundance coming from those nest sites. All right, and then we can predict based on the surroundings of each of those nest sites, how many bees might be visiting. Now I'll emphasize this is a relative score. We don't know exactly how many bees are out there. That, that's just sort of, that's um, some data that we just don't have. We're not exactly sure what the, the true number is. So it's a relative score from zero to one. Uh, so we call that a pollination service score. And here are three tests that have been done uh, at first. And we showed that uh, for modeling uh, native abundance um, that we got pretty good uh, fit in California and Costa Rica, but in some landscapes, it, does, it doesn't always work in every landscape. So in, this is in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and the Eastern United States. We just have never been able to get a good fit there. Uh, and because of that, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't, you know, the model works more generally. And so we did a global test of this, of the production function uh, and many other crops and landscapes around the world. Uh, so this was a paper led by a postdoc of ours, Christina Kennedy, who looked at 39 uh, different studies across 23 crops and six continents. And the model generally worked. Um, there was a lot of variance, but overall we do find this nice strong positive relationship between the pollinator landscape score and the abundance of bees on there. And I just want to point out here that it, the management of those fields matters. And so if it's um, a simple lands, conventional landscape, uh, that's kind of a more intense, there are generally fewer bees. So there's this interaction of local management with the landscape around it. But as the landscape quality increases, we tend to see more bees on those fields. Okay, so that's the kind of the ecology of the bees kind of getting to those fields. The next part, is the valuation. So how do we actually translate abundance into valuation, all right? And so here uh, we have a bee drinking coffee, but really we're gonna be talking about the, the benefits to coffee production of the bees themselves. All right, and uh, a colleague of mine, Taylor Ricketts, did some great work um, testing the model in Costa Rica. Here we see uh, a relatively large coffee plantation in the middle of a landscape. And he sampled sort of from the edge uh, natural areas uh, deep into the coffee plantation to look at how distance from that edge affected uh, production and yield. And he did um, a pollinator exclusion experiment, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. And so to get to valuation, uh, we have to kind of model the, the bees coming from those nest sites, as I imagine. So in this case, imagine that the yellow box here is uh, kind of the crop we're interested in, and they're going to come from the surrounding forests. Okay, this is actually really good for resources for bees in Costa Rica. And so we first model the source abundance of those bees, and we imagine that they're going to fly uh, to uh, that field. And then we'll be able to kind of test that the effect of their, their abundance on crop yield, and then based on where they're coming from, redistribute that value back to the landscape. That's that natural capital, okay, yeah, in the landscape. Okay, and so what... Um, Taylor Ricketts did. Um, he actually looked at the abundance of bees visiting the crops and those sites again were along a gradient and found that as the abundance index increases, we see a really nice fit uh, there. That was one of the original studies. And this was the actual um, effect on pollinate, pollinator limitation. So the production, which is measured in this unit called the fanega in Costa Rica, that um, the production of the uh, coffee actually increases with increasing um, pollinator uh, visitation. And so we can then, then translate that, again, this value back into the landscape, um, which we'll get to in a minute. So here's then this abundance map in corn, in coffee rather. Um, so this is the actual predicted visitation, uh, 107 bees from zero. And we can see there's a strong edge effect, more wild bees are expected along the edge, okay? 
And then if we, we can then retranslate in the actual dollars per hectare coming from wild bees. Okay, that's that back. And then one of the things we can do with that is actually start making a management decision, sort of what is the value of that pollinator providing habitat? Who would be most vulnerable if like landscape were to change? And then what might be the, and the flip side of the value of restoration? And we can do that um, by destroying, imagine that we're destroying forest pixels virtually, converting them to pasture, and then looking at the change in landscape. This is a marginal value approach. And we can see that uh, in areas um, like this peninsula of forest here is probably the most valuable. It's almost acting like a little natural beehive kind of inserting itself into coffee. And so that's where it would actually be $700 per hectare per year uh, lost if you were to destroy that forest. Okay, so high marginal value usually uh, happens where there's already a good source of bees, lots of uh, the demand for that being in the, um, terms of the coffee, and there's few other substitutes. So there's no other landscape around there. And we can also do the same thing, like if we were to lose forest or oh, um, convert them, we can change the production. This is the change in value. So it's sort of the risk. This is where in the field you'd actually be losing that value. All right, and this is sort of the vulnerability of the crop, sort of the opposite of this. There's lots of coffee and lots of demand. There is few um, opportunities um, for kind of saving that in other forests. All right, so basically the, the point here is that the value of the service requires there to be some user, like demand is needed. Okay, and then we can also do this to look at the value of restoration. Maybe we could explore converting some of the crop into uh, forest, okay? It turns out for coffee, that's probably not gonna be great, but you can do this for other crops. Po coffee does not highly dependent on pollinators, but some other crops are. But the point is here, we can start uh, using these models to evaluate what the econ economic value would be. So you can get up to $70 uh, per hectare. In your highest restoration values where there's gonna be lots of coffee around and far from existing sources, okay? So there's relatively low supply of the service. Okay, I'm going to pivot over to uh, Chris to kind of talk about the required data and how you run the model yourself uh, using the INVEST tool. Uh, I'm going to talk about the land use and land cover map that's needed, the attribute table that is used to translate the land cover into habitat quality for bees, and then how we deal with multiple types of species. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you, Chris. All right. So, as Eric has laid out, the INVEST pollinator model uh, has a relatively simple list of inputs, but a lot of complex ecological math underneath the hood. Um, so we'll be walking through today what you plug into INVEST, how you work with that, how you might find sources for that data, and what it looks like so that when you are taking this into your study area, it should be at least conceptually simple to access. So this is what the INVEST uh, user interface looks on my computer. It may look different for you, depending on the version that you've downloaded and are working with. Um, but there should be a list of several uh, files that you need to provide INVEST to run. Um, I've already pre-populated each of these with files on my machine. Um, but you can simply uh, click and drag different uh, required data points onto this interface to make it work. We'll be going through what each of these mean in a bit. Uh, I'll show you this is a, the workplace, a file that you want to drop things in when the model is done. You can just click and drag and it populates right there. So that's how you interact with Invest. But before we get to just hitting the run button down here in this nice little corner, we need to go through what each of these components of the model are. So to start, we're going to look at our land use and land cover map, this bit right here. We're gonna go back to Yolo County in California. And this is what a typical land cover raster of um, crops in the US looks like. This is called the cropland data layer. I think this is 2019. Um, so you can zoom in, you see this is a raster data set. So it's a gridded um, continuous data set with uh, different values representing different land covers on the map. Um, 
In general, the CDL is a very uh, detailed crop inventory. Um, I would say for visual representation, the colorful colors are typically crops. You can see kind of the, the patchwork quilt here in the Central Valley, and the more muted earth tones typically represent wild lands. So you can see on the margins and in the hills on this area, there's lots of wildlands surrounding the Central Valley of crops. So this is the sort of file that you can provide to invest to represent the land use. However, invest doesn't naturally know anything that relates this land cover map to pollinators uh, in itself. You need to provide what is called the biophysical table that links grassland, tree, corn, soybean, almond, whatever crops you have on this layer to expected uh, resources for different pollinating species. So that brings us to this land cover biophysical table in the invest uh, interface here. We have an existing biophysical table for um, the cropland data layer that we've used. Uh, it's been validated by several studies and so you can find this in the literature. Um, and this is what it looks like for this version of the invest model. Again, sometimes the header column names might change in between versions of the invest mo model as code changes in the back end. So always check the user guide for the, the version you are working with. Um, these are the titles for what we are currently working with here. Um, and what this does is this shows uh, the land cover codes. So the value of that raster pixel linking to the name or description of that land cover type. So we have lots of crops here. If you scroll down, you can see there are shrublands, forests, pasturelands, and we, link each of those land covers to different um, types of resources for pollinators. We specifically have uh, two main drivers of the model. It's nesting resources and floral resources. Nesting being uh, various types of pollinator uh, nesting habitats. Here we have ground nesting, cavity nesting, stem nesting, and wood nesting variables. And each of these numbers is an index of quality. So higher numbers from zero to one indicate higher quality nesting sites of these types of nesting habitats. Um, you can collapse many of these categories into a single generalist nesting category if that's what's most important in your study area, or you can expand it to be ground nesting, cavity nesting, et cetera. Um, it, the, the model will respond to correctly labeled headers in that case. Um, the other resource that this table links land cover to is floral capacity on the landscape. So each of these land covers has a different amount of floral resources that bees can use to feed themselves and to promote additional bee abundance on the landscape. Um, again, it's a zero to one index, one being the best amount of floral resources that the landscape could provide. Um, and each land cover will have a different amount of floral resources. These you notice that there are three different columns here. Um, these are different time periods across the year. So we have spring, summer, and fall floral resources for each of these crops and land cover types. Um, in th this has been parameterized for the, the continental US. Um, you can also collapse this to a single, uh, single column for an entire annual representation of um, pollinator floral resources if you want. Um, but the model will respond in granularity. You can either synthesize it up to one generalist nesting and floral resource category or do this uh, much more explicit temporal and nesting um, categorization. So this plugs in right here to the land cover biophysical table. Uh, you'll see that there are nice green check boxes on the right here. Uh, that is the model testing to make sure that your uh, data tables and data inputs are formatted correctly. If they're the right file type, this was a, a CSV, so a comma separated uh, Excel uh, file. This is a, a TIFF or a raster file. Um, there, there's uh, little info boxes that tell you what should go in these um, categories, and it'll give you a big old red X if you've done anything the model won't accept. The final table that we need to talk about before we can hit run is this guild table. So now that we have, now that the model knows how the landscape intersects with resources for pollinators, 
we need to know how those pollinators use those resources. So the guild table is a little bit more simple uh, than the biophysical table. And what it does is it takes a list of bee species. Here we have bombus called out, and then a couple of generalized uh, species here, either a generalist or um, species that specifically rely on small stem nesting or cavity nesting um, resources. And then for each of these species, you can link their dependence on these different kinds of resources using the columns here. So here the generalist species will happily use any of the nesting uh, resources that we've provided the model. So we have ground nesting, cavity nesting, stem nesting, etc. cetera. Um, however, the stem nesting species that we've called out in row four will only use the stem uh, nesting resources here as indicated by this one column. Um, this gives you a, a, an ability to map the different ways different bee species will use the landscape. So you will see different results for these different species depending on how the landscape is providing these different kinds of nesting resources. The same can be said for the foraging activity here on the right. So this is linking the expected ways these different species forage on the landscape, what they're looking for in terms of floral resources during different times of the year. So we can see that for the generalist species, we've averaged it out. It's an even uh, foraging across all three seasons that we've prepped the model for. Um, however, Bombus here is only really foraging in the spring and then a little bit in the summer before not doing any foraging in the fall. So this is a way to look at how different species will rise and fall across a year in terms of their ability to uh, forage. The last two parameters that you need to link each species to are alpha and relative abundance. Alpha is a very key parameter because this is telling the model how far each of these species is going to travel across the landscape to forage for floral resources. Um, this will be in the units of the raster that you provide. So here it's in meters. Um, and here you can see that Bombus is flying a significantly further distance than the, the small stem uh, nesting bee that we have right here that's only traveling about 300 meters. So that gets back to that animated diagram Eric showed earlier that some bees might not be able to forage in the wildlands further and further from their nesting site. And so this helps you really target uh, any restoration that needs to be done in smaller areas for smaller foraging radii bees. The last parameter is the relative abundance of each of these species on the landscape. So in general, this should sum to one across the column. And here we've just made it an even weighting for each of these species because this is a, a, an example. Um, this can be taken from literature from your study area. If you're really focused on Bombus, say you could up this to 0.8 and the others could be 0 0.1, 0.05, etc. With all of this ready and set, um, and all of these nice green checkboxes marked here, you can click Run. We're not going to run this for you. It's it's rather boring to watch two researchers watch a model run on screen. So we've already run um, this to show what the results look like for. Um, this study area. So if we click into the workspace that we provided the model, this results folder here, you can see a list of files. I'm going to take a look at them this way. Um, a list of files, most of them are rasters, uh, along with uh, a log telling you what the model did, and then some intermediate outputs in a separate folder. Um, each of these can be visualized in a GIS. Here we're using ArcGIS, but you can use Q or you can do it natively in a coding environment like Python or R. And we can take a look at, there are two kinds of maps here. There's pollinator abundance and pollinator supply. Pollinator supply, let's take a look at that for bombs. Um, you can throw it on the map and you see right here, it's a, a it's a gradient from zero to about 0.12. Again, as Eric said, these are relative numbers, so we're not expecting 0.12 bees on, on the landscape. This is just a, a low to high abundance ratio. Um, and you can see pretty much immediately that the cropland in the Central Valley is much 
less pollinator heavy than the wildlands to the west uh, in white here. The supply Chris, I, just, I just wanted to jump in and say that this uh, setup for this county and all the bees took about a minute to run. Yeah, this took about a minute to run on my computer. It'll take longer for, for you. I don't have the stats on how big this raster is. We're looking at a 30 meter resolution, so it's not extremely high uh, input raster. But uh, again, it depends on the specs of your machine and the capacity that you have to run the model. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it shouldn't be taking dozens of hours unless you're really running a very high resolution, large land area. Um, so for pollinator supply, this is showing where the pollinators exist in the landscape, where they're nesting, where, where they are starting from. Um, so this is just showing uh, not where you would expect to see them during the day, just where pollinators exist on the landscape uh, in situ. Pollinator abundance is often the map that we typically link to crop production, to indices of value, et cetera. And that, if we look at Bombus, I've already loaded it onto the map, is slightly different. So if we toggle these on and off, you can see the supply is a lot more crisp and the abundance is a lot more um, faded in. And that's because abundance is uh, taking into account that traveling distance. Where are these pollinators coming from their nesting sites or the supply map onto the rest of the map in, a, in an expected way? Um, again, this is a zero to, it's about, again, one point, um, 0 0.04 is the, the ratio here. Again, it's just a relative index, not a number of bees. And in the West, in the wildlands, again, you see an expected higher abundance, but there is some higher amounts of expected abundance on some of these farm fields in the Central Valley, representing that foraging into farmlands from more protected nesting sites in the wildland. So that uh, is the general look of the results of the invest model. Again, you can see over here to the right, there's a lot of different rasters here. And that's because the math or the model will spit out the pairwise combination of um, the different kinds of nesting habitats, the different kinds of species that you, you entered into the model and the different temporal scales of um, foraging that we expect to see. So we can see we have an, a the generalist abundance in fall, in spring, in summer. We have bombus supply, generalist supply, et cetera. So there's uh, different ways of slicing the data that you have provided the model. So with that, I'll return it to Eric to wrap us up. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, and I think uh, just in wrapping up, I uh, will say that if there's more information on the invest um, user guide and the website and uh, literature you can find if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact the kind of the helpline um, that's provided at the website too. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.